emergency in the Galapagos Islands as thousands of liters of oil spill into the sea. Cuba has a new prime minister for the first time in 43 years. And the controversy doesn't end as Saudi Arabia sentences five men to death for the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Carla Gonzalez in Quito and this is from the South. Ecuador has declared an emergency in the Galapagos Islands after over 2,000 liters of diesel were spilled by in the island of San Cristobal early Sunday. A cargo vessel overturned when a large container was being loaded onto the deck and the crane lost control and fell. The crew were forced to jump off the sinking boat and one person is hurt. The National Park has begun works to clean the area. The UNESCO World Heritage Site is home to unique species and is particularly noted for the research conducted there by Charles Darwin, which eventually led him to his theory of evolution. The Mercosur Parliament, Parla Sur, has issued its report of human rights abuses committed by the de facto authorities in Bolivia during its 17th ordinary session taking place in Uruguay. The president of the body's Human Rights Commission condemned the persecution of political leaders who support the post president Evo Morales. We've seen murders conducted with heavy caliber firearms. 32 people have been killed, 800 have been injured, and there are three people disappeared. Among those, a little girl. There have been arbitrary detentions of the injured, who didn't receive medical attention as a result, and that's very serious, as some of those killed died as a result of not getting this attention in hospitals. The burning and destruction of homes, kidnappings and death threats, even torture, they go unpunished. The Bolivian member Edgar Mejia highlighted that the de facto government engages in persecution and torture. He expressed his gratefulness to the Human Rights Commission for visiting Bolivia to comment on what the people are experiencing following the coup. We've had several meetings with the Commission and I am very grateful to the team. They've managed to understand that elected authorities, including representatives and senators, have been persecuted, that they've had their homes burned down, their families stranded, they've had college detained, they met with the family of those who have been arrested, who have been killed, and who have been disappeared. Also in Bolivia, the de facto government, led by Janine Añez, continues its persecution of indigenous communities, their leaders, and social organizations. This is what the Tropic Federation of Chapare had to say about a systematic silencing by the government. Let's see the world that we, the Bolivian people, are suffering from threats, from torture, with all that has happened, the massacre which took place. Now politically, they want to silence all of our rights as citizens. I ask all media on an international level, you must speak out, we must show solidarity among the people. That's why we have asked that international press assist. That's why we ask that they show the situation so you all can see, spread information through the media because we don't have the means to communicate, to inform, because the media has always been favorating them. They have put more than 100 community radios which we previously had. Venezuela's Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza has condemned an attack by a sector of the opposition on a military base in the far south of the country, in Bolivar State, early on Sunday morning. Arreaza tweeted, we will have to see if those international bodies that are so concerned about Venezuela have anything objective to say about these events. Our solidarity goes to the family of the soldier killed. He also said the terrorist group had its base in Peru and received support from Colombia and Brazil. Earlier, the defense minister Vladimir Padrino Lopez said extremist sectors of the opposition had attacked the base and stolen weapons. He said the army and police responded immediately, gave chase to the attackers, arrested some of them and recovered all the weapons. It is understood that the base was in Luepa, in the Gran Sabana, close to the border with Guyana. 
Nicaragua is one of the top five ranked countries in the world, according to the Economic Forum Global Report on Gender Gap in 2020. So let's see how the Central American country managed this achievement. The policies promoted by the government of President Daniel Ortega have the fundamental objective of the inclusion and active participation of women across different social and political spaces. The women's minister, Jessica Padilla, explains. As an institution, we work directly with women. We work on economic empowerment as well as political. We work for the personal development of each woman, and we do this in conjunction with other state institutions. We can't say that this achievement stems from one ministry. It's the government, and we share the responsibility. The Minister for National Policies, Marta Ruiz, recalled that through the anti-imperialist Sandinista struggle, women have played a vital role with important responsibilities in order to defend the country. She pointed to the national heroine Blanca Arauz and the internationalist Teresa Villatoro, among others. In the second stage of the revolution, the equitable inclusion of women has taken an important place. It's about returning rights, because during the 16 years of neoliberal governments, lots of these were lost. At this stage of the revolution, we women in Nicaragua have been able to enjoy our land, our country, and felt part of the process, an important part. If you look at Nicaragua today, we have 16 state ministries, of which nine are led by women, and that's important. For the analyst Adolfo Pastran, this achievement goes beyond the number of women in important political roles. Rather, it's about social advances that have been achieved under this administration. Maternal homes, the reduction of women and infant deaths in childbirth, women in education, young people getting qualification. It's about the recuperation of human and social rights that have afforded women greater power over what happens in Nicaragua. De lo que sucede en Nicaragua. Que lo van a la raíz. With the Human Rights Development Plan, 43% of mayors are women, while 57% of vice mayors are women. In local councils, 51% have women's active participation, while in autonomous councils, that figure is 48%. And at the top of the governmental ladder, 50% of ministerial roles are occupied by women. Still to come, thousands take to the streets against polluting mining practices in Argentina. Stay with us. Welcome back. More news at this hour. On Saturday, Cuba's National Assembly approved the country's first prime minister in 43 years. The new head of government is Manuel Marrero, proposed by President Miguel Díaz-Canel, who remains head of state. After 43 years, Cuba has a prime minister again. The Cuban National Assembly chose Manuel Marrero Cruz, a 56-year-old architect, previously the minister tourism as the head of government. The supreme body of state power also approved the vice premiers and ministers who will make up the cabinet. We can assure you that Comrade Manuel Marrero Cruz, the deputy prime ministers and the chosen ministers will devote themselves completely to continuing the noble task of governing with the people and for the people. Close of the last parliamentary session of the year, President Miguel Diaz-Canel referred to the blockade as the worst obstacle and recalled that the United States has imposed more than one measure a week to strangle the Cuban economy. Our enemies say, and this is repeated by the media who spread their messages, that the blockade aims to hurt the government. That's a lie. The blockade hurts the entire people because it affects all sectors and all actors in the economy. 
The Cuban leader also talked about the international political situation and the United States' aggressive action in the region. He reaffirmed Cuba's solidarity with Venezuela and Nicaragua and condemned the coup in Bolivia and noted how the Chilean model has failed to solve social problems. As far as Cuba is concerned, he said that the challenge is not just to resist but to achieve the greatest possible prosperity. This is a wonderful end of the year in the Assembly, with the appointment of a new Council of Ministers. All of them put forward by our President have very strong track records. I would only say one thing about his new cabinet. I'm convinced this revolution has got it right. We are still here because we are the people. We are Fidel. And Fidel's thought is embedded in each of us Cubans. That means our socialism is a truly deep socialism with the real roots. For many, this was a truly memorable session. For the first time, the leaders of the assembly are not historic leaders of the revolution. Next to the speaker, Fidel's chair, a gradual, organized transition is taking place, with a new generation taking their place. In this 61st year of the revolution, they shot at us to kill. But we are alive and determined to keep on winning. Socialism or death, our country or death, we will win. This is how the final parliamentary session of 2019 ended. The president called on the Cuban people to live the coming hours and days as if the revolution had triumphed again. Around 80,000 people are protesting against corporate extractivism in the Argentine city of Mendoza. Citizens have been marching on the governor's residence since Sunday night against the decision to modify a law that will facilitate polluting mining practices in the region. Demonstrators say that the move will contaminate the local water supply and are demanding that the governor veto the proposed amendment. The Radical Civic Union and Judicial Disparities have voted for changes in order to permit the use of cyanide and sulfuric acid in mining. So the people are in the streets, the whole of Mendoza, and we are here to reject huge mining operations and the pollution in the streets as we do in the legislature. 27 years ago, a researcher in Paraguay discovered what became known as the Archives of Terror, thousands of files that reveal details on how the dictatorships in Paraguay and other South American countries persecuted and killed their opponents. Our correspondent, Osvaldo Sayas, reports. It is 27 years since the so-called archives of terror were found. It took the researcher Martin Almada 15 years to track down these thousands of files which detailed how the dictator Alfredo Stroessner persecuted political opponents and carried out a witch hunt against social leaders. This went on throughout the 35 years of his dictatorship from 1954 to 1989, when he was overthrown in a coup by General Andres Rodriguez. 27 years later, the memory of those events remains very much alive among the victims and their relatives. The Stroessner dictatorship was supported throughout those 35 years by the Colorado Party, which is in government now. In fact, the current president, Mario Abdo Benitez, is the son of Stroessner's private secretary throughout the dictatorship. The discovery of this archive was a hugely important event, not just for Paraguay, but for all of Latin America, because it included details of the notorious Operation Condor, which all the military dictatorships of the Southern Cone worked together to kidnap, torture and forcibly disappear opposition politicians and activists across the region. Osvaldo Sayas from Asunción. Nearly 4,000 people gather on Sunday in Guararema, in the Brazilian state of Sao Paulo, for a football match to celebrate the freedom of former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. The game begins at the Dr. Socrates Brasileiro Stadium. On one side, the landless workers' movement, the hosts. On the other side, the team of former President Lula da Silva, of singer Chico Buarque, and their friends.
The stands are full of supporters who traveled for hours, even days, from different parts of the country. All of them wanted to celebrate Lula's freedom after 580 days in prison. This will help a lot to cheer him up and let him know he's not alone, just as he never left us alone. We hope this really brings us a new perspective for the Brazilian people, for Brazil's government, and that we get to achieve a democracy that is truly effective. The game has just started and the referee has already given a penalty. Luis Inácio prepares to score. And it's a goal, 1-0 to Chico Buarque and Lula da Silva's team. The game is being played at the Florestan Fernandes School, the MST's biggest training centre, which since its foundation in 2005 has given political training to activists from across Brazil and the world. This is a festival of democracy with the friends of MST, a meeting of friends who like football and politics and who are here to have fun. On the pitch are members of Congress, governors, activists of the popular movement, singers and former footballers, united by the same hope. The hope is to move forward and to change this big lie that is out there. We want a Brazil with its own face and not with this lie. It's time for the social movements as a whole and for the Democrats to unite and to win the regional elections, where there is a possibility of victory. We must unite behind the leader and give an answer for Brazil and for Latin America. Brazil is a very important country for Latin America. 2-1, and the Chico Buarque and Lula da Silva team have beaten the MST. But for next year, these two groups promise to come back and unite to defeat the right wing in the streets and at the polls, and return Brazil to the Brazilian people, something very different to the current situation in the country. After the break, 14 West African countries reclaim their financial sovereignty with a new currency. Don't go away. Thank you for joining us again. Let's continue with news. A court in Saudi Arabia has sentenced five men to death for the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The court has, however, acquitted two high-profile individuals who were accused of organizing the murder of, the, of the, these two people, were the former royal advisor Saad al Qatani and the former consul general in Istanbul, Mohammed al Otebi. Khashoggi, a vocal critic of Saudi's crown prince Mohammed bin Salman, was killed and dismembered in October 2018 inside the kingdom's consulate in Istanbul. His body has never been found. All suspects were subject to investigation by the public prosecutor. Those convicted were sent to trial and those who were not were released by the public prosecutor and the court for lack of sufficient evidence. Saud al Qatani was investigated by the public prosecutor and no charge was filed against him because there was no evidence against him. On Sunday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu criticized the International Criminal Court's plan to investigate war crimes within the Palestinian territories. On Friday, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Fatou Ben Souda, announced that it would launch a full investigation into the alleged war crimes as soon as the court's jurisdiction is established. While Palestinians welcomed the decision, Netanyahu claimed that the decision is the result of political persecution. The Prime Minister is defending the occupation of Palestinian territories by Israeli troops and emphasized that the International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction in Palestine. Although we're moving towards new horizons of hope and peace with our Arab neighbors, the International Criminal Court in the Egypt has taken a step backwards and on Friday finally became a weapon in the political war against the state of Israel. Meanwhile, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas welcomed the decision of the International Criminal Court. 
today is a great day for us because we accomplished what we needed because as of today, the International Criminal Court will begin to accept all of the problems. Members of the West African Monetary Union have agreed to stop using the French CFA franc as their currency. The franc will be replaced by a new note called the ECHO. 14 West African countries have used the CFA franc as their currency since 1948, when it was imposed during French colonial rule. Until recently, these countries were also required to keep 50% of the foreign currency reserves in the French treasury and to have a French representative on the board of the region's central bank. I do not understand how today, in the 21st century, that still a country we call France controls the monetary policy of our country. The BCEAO, we call it the Central European Bank in West Africa, because fundamentally it is not a central bank that is free. Since we cannot freely fix the key rates, we cannot freely finance our economy without permission from France. And with that we end our news brief, but you can find all of our stories by checking our website, telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, you can find us on StarSat channel 461 in South Africa and 539 in Nigeria. And be also sure to join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.